This video presents some geological and geotechnical parameters of the proposed exploitation of the gas deposit called the Utica Shale. The Utica is one of the components of a thick sequence of sedimentary strata which was formed about 450 million years ago. The Utica Shale was formed by the sedimentation of marine muds with an abundance of organic material. The transformation of these sediments into hard and barely permeable rock strata imprisoned this organic material. The Utica outcrops west of the St. Lawrence. It extends below the surface more to the east, up to the beginning of the Appalachian Mountains. Under Utica, there are layers of limestone, shown in blue. Above the Utica are the Lorraine and Queenston groups also formed of shale. But not only shale, one also finds here strata of more permeable sandstone. A longitudinal cut of the plain shows us this stratification. The extraction of the gas in the Utica shale cannot be done except by crisscrossing the whole plain with about 20,000 wells. In fracturing that amount of the rock, one may expect to recover about 20% of the methane contained in the gas deposit. But that cannot be done except at the price of a considerable and irreversible transformation. At the end of the operation, it would be suitable to rename the formation the fractured Utica. All this goes on in the depths, out of sight. As it might be thought that only the rural areas are affected, I will now explain what a gas well is in three dimensions and in order better visualize the scale, I will place it in the middle of the city. Here is a volume of one cubic kilometer. Above, there is the surface soil. The water table is represented in blue. The well, shown here in pink, crosses the whole layer of a thousand meters and then plunges horizontally into the Utica Shale containing the gas. The fracturing, when all goes well, is placed throughout the whole thickness of the Utica, 100 meters in this model. It is done in eight or ten sections in the horizontal part of the drilling. 100 meters of Utica is the minimal value because the median thickness of this shale is more usually 200 meters. So in this cube, with a one square kilometer surface imprint and 100 meters of thickness, we get a volume of 100 million cubic meters of gas ore, acquired at the staggering price of $10 a year. When the deposit is thicker, the cost by the ton of that ore is two cents per million tons. Let's now look at the same operations in the case when the horizontal drilling encounters a geologic fault, schematized here by the red plane. These faults, of which only a portion is shown here in the kilometric cube, in reality have very much longer extensions and cut through several geologic layers. It is possible only one drilling in 10 or 1 in 100 will cut through a fault. We don't know enough about their numbers and their distribution to be more precise. But what is certain is that in drilling everywhere in the Utica, there will be scores, indeed hundreds, of problematic cases. Let's go back to the animation, which shows one stage in the hydraulic fracturing in the layer of the Utica, still in the case of 100 meter thick layer. The injection under pressure on the order of three to 400 times atmospheric pressure progressively opens new fractures in the rock. It is easier for the fractures to extend upwards than down because of the natural pressure field. With the fluid, solid particles are injected, introducing them into the fissures in order to keep them permanently open. As the fluid injection under very high pressure reaches the fault, the zone of least resistance concentrates the flow in the plane of the fault. In this way, a path of communication between the depths and the surface is created. In forcing its opening and in injecting sand with the fluid, communication has been enhanced in an irreversible fashion with the surface layer. What is most put in direct communication is the methane from the depths, now liberated by the hydraulic frac and the surface above. Let's look again at the animation, because it is important to understand all the consequences of this risk. Once open, this communicating path will be extremely complex, indeed impossible to fix. A thousand meters deep and far from the surface drilling, this type of problem will be extremely costly to deal with. Additionally, depending on the case and the depth, consequences might not appear for several years. The 
drilling hole which penetrates through the thousand meters of rock is restricted in its diameter. It is possible to try to close off the opening, but the fissure plane on the other hand extends for some kilometers and its exact location itself is difficult to determine. To completely seal off the zone, it will in fact be impossible. It is not only that gas can use this path to the surface, but also supersalinated waters from the depth, where all subterranean flow will have been greatly disturbed by the new fractures. In an attempt to evaluate the long-term consequences, we must take a look at what this technique of extraction will actually produce. As a function of the thickness of the shale, the length of the drilling, and the lateral and vertical penetration of the produced fractures, it is 50, 100, or even 150 million cubic meters of rock which will now have an augmented per permeability of several orders of magnitude. This reservoir contains compressed methane in a porosity of about 3% of the total volume. The gas is compressed under a very high pressure in its natural state, which implies that the normalized volume of methane is very much higher is of the same order of magnitude as that of the rock, which initially contained it. The new fractures in this reservoir initiate a geological process which liberates large quantities of gas in the first month. But then, the flow slows and diminishes in an exponential fashion. Let's look at a close view of what happens in the immediate proximity to some fractures. The imprisoned gas a few millimeters from the fractures enters them quickly due to the gradient of pressure, which is enormous. The micropores a few centimeters away will take years, and those which are further yet in the mass of the shale not joined to the fracture will take centuries and millennia to complete their migration. The geological process of the migration of the gas takes time, and there's no way to speed it up. That is the reason that the production curve of a well shows a downward curve with a hyperbolic exponent. The flow never goes to zero in this type of curve, except at infinity on the time axis. When the profitable production is over after a few years, there is still 80% of the methane in the shale, which continues this slow process. Conventional gas deposits were created by a similar process, but this occurred over geological time, which is to say hundreds of thousands, indeed millions of years. At the end of the period considered profitable, the wells will be closed. This procedure consists of plugging the pipe above the layer of the utica and at shallow depth, as well as different types of restoration work on the surface. But the well itself does not disappear for all that. The work which was conceived and perfected to extract the gas will be required to perform the opposite function. At the time of the well's construction, grout is pushed upwards into the narrow annular space of barely a few centimeters between the casing and the rock. This is not a resistant cement, which can be thus put in place for over a thousand meters between close walls. The grout is a very fluid product, which was originally intended to ensure the stability of the tube and additionally to seal the exterior void space of the well. But there are concentric shrinkage fissures, badly sealed spaces between the rock and the tube due to the grout being badly adapted to local conditions, insufficient cleaning of the drilling sludge, uncontrolled water seepage, fractures present in the rock in close proximity to the wall, and other causes explain the frequent problems of leaks in the exterior seal. The thousand meter conduit in our example traverses all the rock to the reservoir, which upon being abandoned contains more than three quarters of its original contents. Even perfectly sealed, this conduit has a permeability many thousand times greater than the rock in which it was drilled. As in all works made from steel and concrete, one must question the length of life of this structure, which will now have to operate for centuries to come as a cork resisting the growing pressure from the gas in the reservoir. What will matter is the durability of the grout placed between the steel tubing and the rock walls of the drill hole. But no matter what the type of material, cement, grout, and steel, the question of the longevity of the structure has to be asked. Conceived as it was for the optimal short-term removal of the gas, it has been summarily transformed for a completely different function. I say summarily because the industry, restricting itself to the traditional rules, is really constrained mainly to restore the surface of the site. With this new method of hydraulic fracturing, one should not act as was done for other types of wells, which are not at all comparable. In engineering, we do not transform a footbridge into a viaduct without asking the fundamental question of its durability and resistance over time. What will be the management cost of all these wells 
abandoned or transferred to the state? What will be the cost of repeated periodic resealing while the gas is mobile in the reservoir? <laughs>